thank you again for the grace extended to us to have access to the mind of your Son. And it is in his name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. All right. Notice that in verse 32, since we've gone through the uh, potentially scary part, if you don't really understand what Christ is, is speaking about, verse 32, I just want to focus for our purposes tonight on the end of verse 32. I'll read the whole verse. Matthew 12, verse 32, For whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Or you notice if you're reading from the New American Standard Version, the second use of age is in italics. Uh, better translation would be either in this age or the one to come. All right, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And in Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to start at uh, verse 8, uh, verse 18. The Apostle Paul tended to be involved in very long prayers and very long sentences in his epistles. So just to uh, pick up the beginning of a, a long sentence, uh, well, I, actually, I could have picked it up a little later, but verse 18 is a good, a, a good place to begin. Ephesians 1, verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope or assurance of his calling. What are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Paul, uh, let's see, uh, let's go on to verse 20. Which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So we have a parallel statement from the Apostle Paul with a statement that we just read that was given by Christ in Matthew 12, and that is this age and also the one to come. The Apostle Paul had the same worldview as to the periods of time related to world events that Christ did in Matthew chapter 12, and that they had uh, through the Old Testament times into the, the period of the Gospels. In fact, at the very same time Christ was teaching in his earthly ministry, in his yet-to-be-glorified body, his unglorified body, three-and-a-half-year ministry, there was a man named Saul 
from the city of Tarsus who didn't know Christ, didn't know what he was teaching, but because he was a Pharisee raised up in the Jewish tradition, was also very familiar with Hellenism, but uh, as to uh, his Phariseeism, he was a strict Pharisee. And I would venture to say that at the same time that Christ was describing in Matthew chapter 12, this age and the one to come, the unbelieving Pharisee from the tribe of Benjamin, whose name was Saul before he was converted and before his name uh, was changed to Paul, I would venture to say that this unbelieving Pharisee likely had the same world view as to these two periods of time related to world events because that was traditional Judaism. And Christ was a Jew and his background was in traditional Judaism and Saul of Tarsus even uh, in, in his unbelieving state before his radical conversion, uh, Saul of Tarsus was had been raised up in the traditions of Judaism. And in fact, in uh, his keeping of these strict codes, he said that he he said, he wrote to the Galatians that, that uh, he advanced beyond his appears uh, in kind of a celebrity status of, of being the best that Judaism had to offer. But he likely had the same worldview of these two ages at the bottom of your chart as they are related to world events, the age in which he lived, the present age, and the age in which the coming Messiah would rule his kingdom. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians is just before Ephesians in the, the placement in your Bibles. Galatians chapter 1. And we'll just pick it up from verse 3 uh, as Paul goes on in his salutation. Galatians 1 verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God the Father. Now, the rescue of which he was describing was a rescue from the thinking of this age from the uh, spirit, <clears throat> spirit of this age and the conformity of our minds to this age. But notice he says this present evil age, the age that, that he was in presently, that the age we are still in presently as we are still uh, in the, the, the present age in which Paul was. It's still the same age, in other words. And th that was the same age Christ was in. 
in his unglorified humanity, the same age David was in, the same age Moses was in, the same age Moses was in, uh, the Old Testament saints, right back to Adam after the fall. Since the fall, it's been an evil age, a present evil age. Now, during this present age, God has introduced quite recently in terms of, of relative time a new dispensation. That is the dispensation of the grace of God. In Ephesians 3 verse 2, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he gave to me the mystery of which I wrote before in brief, that when you read, you might have insight into this mystery in Ephesians chapter 3. And this was a dispensation, the dispensation of the grace of God. In Colossians 1, 24, I believe he calls it simply the dispensation of God. But he was talking about the same dispensation. But never confuse, and this is, this is where a lot of believers, even dispensationalists, become confused. Never confuse a dispensation with an age. Don't confuse dispensations with ages. During what was noted by the Old and New Testaments and by Christ and by Paul as this present age which precedes the age to come, during this present age there have been a number of dispensations. Dispensations are administrations which are active which are operative during time periods. And the, the various time periods with, through which the dispensations has operated, for example, the, the uh, dispensation we call the dispensation of, of, of uh, innocence in the garden before the fall, and there's another dispensation uh, that uh, that followed Adam's sin, and people generally assume that it, it uh, goes up until the period of Noah, and then there was the the dispensation uh, from Noah up to the dispensation of the law. Some people work other dispensations into that. But all of these dispensations after the fall of Adam can really be understood to be within this present age, just at different places along the timeline. They operate through different places along the timeline. But ages are time where dispensations are administrations. That's apples and oranges. And that's what we need to understand. Administrations operate through time. So don't confuse dispensations with ages. Now, if you go with me to Matthew 16, Matthew chapter 16, And in Matthew chapter 16, 
you you wonder why I'm covering this particular verse, but I think it will become evident when we move on. Matthew 16, verse 28. And Jesus says to his disciples, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, many students of the Bible and commentators try to get around what Christ is really saying here by noting that in the next chapter came the transfiguration when he, when Jesus appeared with Elijah and Moses. So uh, that's what he was talking about in verse 28. Well, the problem with that is uh, he, the Son of Man wasn't coming in his kingdom as described in Matthew chapter 24, which actually describes the second advent of Jesus Christ. They all understood that the Son of Man coming in his kingdom would be at the beginning of the age to come. Now, it is important to understand with this, and it is uh, because of the way that, that the Greek grammar works, and I, I'm, I, I'm always clear about this, I, I'm not a Greek scholar. I had Greek for one year in Bible college. My uh, understanding of Greek, uh, little as it is, has come much more in my study after Bible college than during Bible college. And I work with, with uh, tools of technical analysis to go to the, the manuscripts we have and uh, to be able to, to uh, do the, the parsing and so forth. I, I I can't just pick up a Greek manuscript and just read it and interpret it. I spend hours and hours and hours of time in doing these things. But I do know the, the basic rules of, of Greek grammar from the most respected textbooks uh, that, that uh, students of the Greek grammar use. Uh, and I... Uh, use very res respected lexicons, and in the, within the rules of grammar and the use of the subjunctive mood in two verbs in this passage, if you were to translate this into English, it, it it's very awkward to do so, and as close as we can come before before putting it another way, but really getting at the sense in good English of, of what is meant, this, this would be directly translated, truly I say unto you, there are some who uh, are... Standing here, there are some of those who are standing here who will most certainly not taste death until they may have seen the Son of Man coming from or coming in his kingdom. That's what actually is, you know, it's not clear in English, yet it can be if you think about it. I'll say it again. Truly I say unto you, there are some of those who are standing here who will most certainly not taste death until they may have seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What is that doing? It's, leave, it's, it's leaving the door open, which is the condition that 
the Greek grammar requires in the, the last clause of this verse. There is a condition that needs to be fulfilled. He's not really giving the condition, but he's saying that that you're seeing the kingdom of man coming in his kingdom. It, it may happen, but it, it is conditional. And of course, the condition was that when Israel was finally offered the kingdom, Israel ex would accept the, the kingdom during their own lifetimes. In better English, it's looser and it's less specific, but it's better. There's a possibility that some of you who are standing right here uh, will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his, in his kingdom. He was leaving the door open, but he was also allowing for the fact uh, that they would not live to see Christ coming into his kingdom. They'd be physically, a de physically dead before he did. Of course, God knew this from eternity. Had Israel accepted the offer, the prophetic program would have continued including Daniel's 70th week, which, which John hadn't detailed yet, including the, the prophecy about the time of Jacob's trouble, including Ezekiel 37, 38, uh, 39, and Psalm 83. Now, bear in mind... Time is no obstacle with God. And had, just uh, speculatively, had Israel accepted the offer of the kingdom that was given in Acts 3, verses 19 through 21, God certainly within a seven-year period could have compacted all of these things. And they could have gone along very quickly and yes, it would have been the time of Jacob's trouble, but it did. It would not have had to been nearly as severe as has been described by John as during the uh, last chronological uh, New Testament book. That is, it was it was written the last, so far as we know. That some that's debated by some, but uh, in any case, it describes something that was written after the kingdom had been formally rejected by Israel, and after that formal rejection, whenever the book of Revelation was actually written, it was after the formal rejection of the kingdom by Israel and after John had his vision on the island of Patmos. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, or Matthew uh, chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Now, I'll tell you what. First, turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Then we'll... To me, it makes more logical, logical sense to... Go here first. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. And remember, 
fact, let's go back to it here. Remember, in Matthew 24, you, you can stay in Matthew 28 because I'm just rereading something that we read at the beginning of the session as Christ was sitting on the Mount of Olives with uh, certain disciples and they said, tell us when will these things happen and and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So in Matthew 28, after Christ's resurrection, we have him giving a commission to his disciples. Matthew 28, verse 16. But even the disciples proceeded to Galilee... Or I'm sorry, but the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. What authority had been given to him? the authority in Psalm 110, verse 1, where the Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. That authority had been given to Christ. He has that authority right now. The only reason it hasn't happened yet is because Israel rejected the king. God allowed them to redo that to do that. So Israel rejected the king and his kingdom that was offered in Acts chapter 3. But Jesus has the authority to assume the throne of David. It came through his resurrection. Now, to continue. Verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even uneven to the end of the age. Now think of this. They were asking him what? In Matthew 24, on the Mount of Olives, about the end of the age. And here, in this commission given to the same disciples... He is saying that I am with you. Of course, that didn't mean physically, but because he would be at the right hand of the Father until his enemies are made his footstool, but he would be with them in power and in spirit. If this passage is directed to the body of Christ, then certainly the body of Christ is going to go through Daniel's 70th week. If you don't believe it from this, uh, maybe you'll believe it when we, when we turn back to Matthew 24 momentarily. But if this is directed to the body of Christ, then the body of Christ is going through Daniel's 70th week. Because he's saying that he is with them until the end of the age. We're going to find not this week, because it's, we're going to it next week, but in a passage which describes the same details Matthew was uh, describing as spoken by Christ in Matthew 24, Luke described these in Luke 21, 
Luke's description was was with more of a focus on the destruction of the temple. Matthew's focus was more upon the second coming of Christ, but they don't contradict one another. And we're going to see in Luke how the protection that the Lord offers these Jews under persecution is going to be fulfilled very precisely during Daniel's 70th week and very directly with the 144,000 Jewish male virgins that God raises up to evangelize. And they're going to be very supernaturally protected. And Luke really gets into that in quite some detail. It's amazing. I I never saw it before uh, studying it recently, how, how minute the detail of this is. But this is directed toward This commission is directed toward the 12 who will sit on 12 thrones of the uh, uh, judging the 12 tribes of Israel in the age to come. And since Daniel's 70th week has been projected into the future, it's going to be directed toward Jews during the Uh, uh, during Daniel's 70th week, uh, Jews even possibly during times preceding Daniel's 70th week, and it's going to find precise, very precise fulfillment uh, regarding the 144,000 that God is going to raise up to protect. Now, look at me. Uh, in Matthew 24, at one more verse tonight with which we'll close. One more verse and we'll close. We'll have you out a couple minutes early uh, to make up for other times. Matthew 24, verse 14 In the Olivet Discourse, which I've taught many times over many years, but in Matthew 24, verse 14, Jesus says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. What is the end that's going to come? What is the end that the disciples were thinking about when they asked at the beginning of this discourse or before this discourse actually started, just before it started, about uh, the sign of the end of the age? He's telling them that the gospel of the kingdom, among other things that he goes through in this discourse, but he says that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Okay, we've covered these two ages tonight, this present age and the age to come. We're going to to discuss two more things that are on the timeline next week, and that is the times of the Gentiles spoken of by, uh, that phrase was used by Christ in Luke chapter 21, and the fullness of the Gentiles, a phrase which Paul used. They mean two different things. They, there is some overlap on the timeline, some overlap, but they mean two entirely different things. And we'll be 
taking those up next week. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the understanding that you give as we make progress in the word of God by your grace and through the teaching of the Holy Spirit given graciously. And we do it together. We thank you for it. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen.